Hey there, murderinos and true crime fanatics. Welcome to the first episode of Let's Talk About Death, Baby. I'm your host, Maggie, and I'm thrilled to dive into the dark and mysterious world of true crime with all of you. But before we get started, let me introduce myself and give you a glimpse into how this podcast is a little different from the rest. You see, I'm not just an ordinary true crime enthusiast. I have multiple unique gifts. I'm a medium, and I possess the ability to communicate with spirits. It all started, the idea and seed for this podcast all started when I stumbled upon a place that seemed to hold a very disturbing secret, a murder that took place in the heart of Hollywood. The City of Angels is no stranger to that, but at the infamous crossroads of the world, This was something different. But here's the twist. Before I even researched it, I sensed something eerie lingering in the air. Something that whispered of a dark past. The first thing I remember saying was, Wow, this feels like it's a stronghold for the mob. Did somebody get murdered here? And our friend that had met us there was like, yeah, there actually was. Like the guy who, the guy who used to live here or the guy who had some offices here uh, allegedly worked with the mob. And you know, back in like the twenties or something. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. You know, just brushed it off. We walk around the property and it is incredible. It's got a full recording studio with the most gorgeous piano I've ever seen. There have been tons of music remastered and mastered there. And honestly, we've got to really dive into that for a second. There has been so much music to come out of Crossroads of the World that it is literally labeled the nexus of Hollywood creativity. This is from an article, discoverhollywood.com. As one of the most recognizable structures in Los Angeles, Crossroads of the World is forever embedded in the fabric of Hollywood history. It's as much a part of what draws people to the entertainment capital of the world as the Hollywood sign and the Walk of Fame. In 1977, Graham Nash of the iconic Crosby, Stills, and Nash restored this studio. And three decades later, after Master Studio took over, the co-founder and CEO, Larry Reichman, reflects on the diverse history of the famed studio. Quote, everybody came. The Eagles, Linda Ronstadt, Fleetwood Mac. Then it went into disrepair. Homeless people lived in these hallways and offices. Then, Mort Lacretz bought the property and completely changed it. But let's go back in time. First, to when I arrived on the property. And I had this feeling, something was telling me. There's definitely been a murder here. Not only did the place give off this like very strong fortress vibes, it was also right next to a church. So it was, it just was like the setting of a movie. It was so perfect to be a movie set and there were definitely spirits there, more than one, and you'll learn who they were here. And now that we know there were also homeless people living in this establishment for some time I'm sure we've got some spirits I'm sure we've got a lot of spirits in this place let's continue 
Thank you so much to the website pbssocal.org. That's not sponsored, but <laughs> I love PBS. We also love PBS. You can read the entire article online, and I'm going to give you some bits and pieces of it here, interwoven with my experience and my story. So let's begin. On May 20th, 1931, at 6665 Sunset Boulevard, this ivy-covered bungalow was shared by a realtor, a photographer, and the owner of the building who was a very big, jovial, high-pitched businessman by the name of Charlie Crawford. Charlie had his office in the back with dark wood paneling covered in wires and almost no natural light except the little bit that could find its way through the mesh-covered skylight. Four telephones sat on a giant desk, along with a panic button. The doors had special locks and steel bars, and a large safe sat against one wall. Now, I don't know what movie that sounds like to you, but it sounds like the Godfather to me. Um, <laughs> or Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But come on. Okay. So, like, the vibes I was getting immediately as I got there. So, like, was a ghost the ghost of a mobster or alleged mobster telling me that, hey, it, you know, it was cool. I was invited there. I was welcomed there. So nothing weird happened. Nothing bad happened when I was there. It was actually a lovely experience. Um, it literally inspired me to make this entire podcast. So thank you to the ghosts of Crossroads of the World. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Around 4.30 on that day, shots rang out. Then, a dapper man in a double-breasted suit walked calmly out of the side door and got into a car where this says a bejeweled blonde woman was waiting. Now, when this article was written, Taylor Swift had not taken ownership of the word bejeweled yet, and... Now, when we hear bejeweled blonde woman, who we, we immediately think of Taylor Swift, but this is 1931, so that is not, that is not what we're thinking here. Now, this seems a little sus. So, these men, or this man, is seen walking out of the side door after some shots have rang out on this typical business day in the office complex. Inside, Charlie Crawford was clinging to his life. Herbert Spencer lay dead. Charlie was taken to the Georgia Street Hospital where his wife, Ella, a lovely woman with blonde hair and blue eyes, also sounds like we're just, everybody looked like Taylor Swift in the 30s, okay? Rushed down the halls with her Bible demanding to see her husband. They sound very strong Catholics. That's right. The Catholic Church is right beside it. And there's a fun fact about how this church was overtaken by so many people for this specific service. The LAPD detective asks Charlie who shot him. And Charlie smiled and said, I don't know. Ask Spencer. After being pressed further... He smiled again. So he smiled when he said, I don't know, ask Spencer. And after being pressed again, he smiled and just died. 
he stayed true to the code. He didn't snitch. Because Charlie wasn't a real estate agent or a politician as the newspapers frequently labeled him. His wife stands over his corpse, tears rolling down her face. She wasn't simply a privileged housewife. Formerly Miss Odessa Ella Wedding of Minneapolis, who lived at 929 Rexford Drive in Beverly Hills. She was the wife of the man who once ruled Los Angeles's underworld, known to all of the Southland as the Grey Wolf of Spring Street. Charles Crawford had gotten his start in boomtown Seattle at the turn of the century, operating casinos and bordellos and eventually making his way to the mayor's office. Around 1910, Seattle voted in a reform mayor and began an investigation into his activities. Charlie, followed by some of his cronies, headed down to the sunny and lawless Los Angeles and opened the Maple Bar at Fifth and Maple, which also featured a casino and bordello and was frequented by the city's ruling elite. By the 1920s, Charlie was the boss of an informal but ruthless crime syndicate commonly known as the City Hall Gang. From 1921 to 1929, Charlie, along with political fixer Kent Kane Parrott, virtually ran the city, using puppet mayor George E. Cryer as the front man. As the markets crashed, so did Charlie's empire. The Seattle situation happened all over again, as a reforming mayor was voted into office and Charlie was indicted for various crimes. Charlie publicly attempted to clean up his act, focusing on real estate and claiming to have found God with the help of his wife. He started a magazine, Critic of Critics, and hired his friend, Herbert Spencer, to be the editor. But privately, Charlie was up to the same old tricks. Critic of Critics was simply a tool in a propaganda campaign against targeted city officials. On that afternoon in 1931, for reasons that were never entirely clear, handsome Dave Clark, a USC grad, corrupt district attorney, and candidate for city judge, came to meet with Spencer and Charlie. As the prosecutor later stated, there were three racketeers in the bungalow's back office. Only one came out. Now let's talk about Miss Ella. Miss Ella Crawford talked with a group of newspaper reporters, quote, saying, I bear no malice in my heart towards anyone. I don't know why she has a southern accent in my mind, but she does now. And I do not believe in capital punishment, even though this man just murdered her husband. I believe that it is against the commandments of God to take a human life. I think the murderer of my husband should be treated as any other criminal. And that was quoted in the Los Angeles Times on August 6, 1931. Ella was now alone, with two small daughters, Eleanor and Joan, to raise as a single mother in 1931, at the, at the literal start of the Depression. No matter what she had known or thought of her husband's dirty dealings during their highly publicized trials, Ella defended her husband with a pious vim and vigor that bellied her helpless appearance. Dave and his wife, Nancy, turned out to be media stars, a highly attractive couple who won both the public and the jurors' sympathy and adulation. They relentlessly courted the press, Dave inviting them into his cell to watch him play poker with other accused murderers, Nancy granting endless interviews. Ella and Spencer's widow also became media figures with daily reports on what they wore and their demeanor in the courtroom. Ella was the more reserved of the two, 
often patting the hand of Spencer's widow while she sobbed uncontrollably and appearing at the trial only occasionally. When she was called to testify, she took the stand in a black silk two-piece suit with a touch of color at the throat and spoke in a clear voice with calm blue eyes. When she was asked if her husband had carried a gun on the day of the shooting, a vital piece of evidence since Clark claimed he had shot in self-defense, Ella said he had not. When asked how she knew, she smiled slightly, reminiscent of her good time husband, and rolling a bit of paper between her gloved fingers, she stated, He embraced me when he left home. He always did it before he left me. And if he had been wearing a a revolver, I would have felt it. Even though she seemed calm, Ella's blood was boiling. The murders were to be tried separately, with Spencer's death up first. While the judge read the jury his instructions, Ella sat silently. On occasion, a tear would be seen trickling down her face. On August 24th, when the star-struck jury came back with a vote of not guilty, she was at the home of friends and declined to comment. But two days later, back in her palatial, columned mansion in Beverly Hills, Ella let loose issuing a remarkable statement that reveals more about her character than any sufficient words ever could. At the close of the trial, as I was coming out of the building called the Hall of Justice, thinking of the injustice expressed by the verdict in the trial involving the slaying of my husband, I stepped across the street and was confronted by an inscription of an old building that had been erected many years before it said it is not your battle but god's so as far as i am concerned district attorney fitz need not put any more burlesque shows in the trial of my husband's slayer in these times of depression it would be far better if the taxpayers be saved the cost of another futile gesture such as just completed in the trial The memory of my husband was besmirched and a halo placed on the head of his slayer against the forces of evil and hypocrisy which now control this city. Even reaching into pulpits to spread false rumors and reports and into official circles to pervert justice, a lone woman cannot prevail. It must indeed be a dull conscience and complacent public which can view with unconcern the fecurical conduct and outcome of this case. Sadly enough, it is not the first nor will it be the last if justice is to continue to be administered by such hands. Only a few months ago, gangsters shot and hopelessly crippled an honest policeman doing his duty and attempting to arrest criminals. They were defended by one of the same attorneys who defended Clark. They put on the same kind of self-defense story to say they used in the case and a jury of American citizens acquitted the gangsters? So widows are robbed of their husbands, children robbed of their fathers, mothers robbed of their sons, and this is called justice. Ooh, Miss Ella. Miss Ella built Crossroads of the World to be what it is and what it looks like today. It didn't look like that whenever they had these offices here. It was just a regular building. It just had, it wasn't anything special before Miss Ella was driven by her pursuit of justice. And that wasn't even Ella, like, oh God, just like Miss, like, it's incredible. This story is so incredible. The passion and drive that this woman has and the way that this place is built is the reason that we still have it today. And I very much believe that places have energetic residue. And this place is full of residue. Like if you've been to Crossroads of the World, please send us an email and you'll get the email. It's in the show notes. You can listen to the end of the episode. 
you have to send us an email if you've been there. It can be anonymous. You can hide your email. I don't care. We're not going to see it. Just please share your stories of Crossroads of the World. All right, getting back into it. Ella continued to battle with the DA in the days leading up to the second trial. On September 16th, she wrote an angry letter to Fitz, accusing prosecutor Joseph Ford of asking her for money and accusing Fitz and Ford of dragging her husband's name through the mud and mounting a half-assed prosecution. This time, the prosecution fought back, claiming they had not asked her for money. Fitz seemed fed up and hinted at feuds now obscurely by stating, quote, I propose to give Mr. Ford every assistance which he may desire and do not propose to be dictated to or by the whim or caprice of any person. The second trial occurred, and just as Ella feared, Debonair Dave was acquitted. He would kill again in 1953 and die a few weeks later, but he was acquitted. Perhaps in reaction to the verdict and wishing to escape, Ella rushed into a second marriage. She met C. Roy Smith, a dubious San Francisco real estate man of questionable marital status at the time, at a party in September, and they were married in January in Yuma, Arizona. Interesting. So in 1932, they went to Yuma, Arizona to get married. The usually camera shy Ella posed for pictures gushing, we found we had much in common and the romance grew naturally. I am happy to have had the love of two such men as Mr. Crawford and Mr. Smith. Not surprisingly, the marriage was over by 1934 and Ella reclaiming the name of Crawford for business reasons. Now, since the first trial in 1931, Ella expressed her intention to carry on her husband's real estate ventures. In 1935, the IRS came after Charles Crawford's estate for over $42,000 in back taxes. So what is that in today's money, you ask? Let's see. It is $848,000 $848,000 in today's money. So nothing small. Crawford's estate was set at $113,000, 21000 of which was in cash. So his estate was set at over $2 million and a little over 400000 of that was in cash. It was around this time that Ella had a vision Quote, now see, I didn't know this, but I was picking up on this like Southern, Southern accent, something I hadn't like, this is fantastic. So the quote, I hadn't read this quote before now. It says, by golly, life is going fast here. She exclaimed as she thought about the empty murder bungalow and surrounding city blocks she now owned. In its sordid place, she pictured a calm dignified fantasy land of multinational buildings modeled on the famous trade market of Jerusalem. In classic Hollywood fashion, she set out to whitewash 6665 Sunset Boulevard's sordid past and in the process create an entire complex dated to the concept of escape and commerce. And this is why we have the first outdoor mall in America. And in 1936, Ella published a advertisement in the Los Angeles Times that read, make gift selections in Hollywood's most unique shopping center, Crossroads of the World, between Cherokee and Las Palmas. Join Hollywood's leading screen stars and civic leaders. Make your Christmas gift selections in this colorful new international city of shops and studios, a wealth of exquisite, highly desirable merchandise from all over the world, myriads of suggestions for even the most difficult people on your shopping list. So Miss Ella knew what she was doing here. And that's definitely the vibe that I got from being there is that this was such an intentionally curated place. Miss Ella said to the New York Times, it would be like taking a trip around the world. Visitors coming here expect to see something beautiful and unusual, given the widespread publicity in some of our motion pictures. Ella enlisted the modern architect Robert V. Dara, 
who also designed the Coca-Cola bottling plant at 1200 South Central Avenue. He was in charge of the $12,000 project. There was to be a main building in the shape of an ocean liner in the front center of the property as if it were coming to port. Surrounding it would be buildings in Cape Cod, Italian, French, Old English, and early Californian styles. With an eye for the hope, she wanted to have over a hundred international shops, artist studios, and restaurants. Bay windows were constructed to enhance the display of the merchandise. In the back, there was a lighthouse. In the middle, a shaded patio. And on top of the ocean liner was a 60-foot tower that was topped with a turning globe. The haunted bungalow was raised and the construction began at the end of May, 1936. The grand opening was on October 29th and was purely a Hollywood event. A cadre of universal film players from all over the world joined several foreign councils as folk singers, native dancers, and world musicians entertained the masses who came to see the nation's first outdoor mall. Miss Ella was very satisfied very quickly because the shops did fill with the stars and the clientele that she had always hoped for. Ads from the late 30s included Anna Herbert's hand-dipped chocolates, Delaine Benati's exclusive fashions and fabrics, Marcy de Paris's perfumes and powders, Mildred Asher, who specialized in peasant houses, gardens and provisional feeling design, McDonald Mayer's importers of piping Shanghai Oriental Arts, and more ec eclectic tenets like Burr McIntosh, the cheerful philosopher, the puppeteer Everett Burgess, and the community theater pioneer Neely Dixon. And the Sigma Kappas gathered at the restaurant Le Mirian Da, and several charities established their headquarters there. With Ella's dream fully realized, it is here that she bows out of the story and back into the private life that she really craved. She continued in the real estate business and is mentioned in the LA Times article from the 1940s where she and her daughter Joan were in a serious car accident. With both of her daughters married and now a grandmother of six, Ella, who seems to have never wed again, passed away in 1953. Perhaps her final triumph, her obituary, described her simply as the widow of Charles H. Crawford, former builder and loan official. Let's get back to Charles Crawford. He wasn't called Good Time Charlie for anything. In the Los Angeles Times, this was printed. More than a thousand persons representing a cross-section of life gathered at St. Paul's Presbyterian Church today at final rites for Charles H. Crawford on May 24, 1931 in the Helena Daily Independent. Slain in his office along with Herbert Spencer, newspaper man, on Wednesday. Men of the underworld who recognized Crawford as the Grey Wolf rubbed elbows with those who knew the man as a recent brother in the church, a member whose contributions totaled more than $25,000. This information is from the nationalcrimesyndicate.com. So Good Time Charlie was one of the most powerful men on the LA underworld scene during the bulk of prohibition, was more political than a bootlegger. As a leading figure of the Spring Street Vice Operators known as The Combination, Crawford held ties to the city's gambling, prostitution, and bootlegging rackets. On the legal side of the house, he dabbled in real estate and insurance, though he no doubt manipulated these professions to make an easy buck as well. This was his reputation. Crawford also owned night spots around the city, including the popular bar, The Maple. So remember, this was in 1931 when he was murdered. He was running the city from 1920 to 1931. Crawford, at the time of his death, the papers identified him as a financial backer of the Critic of Critics magazine. 
Spencer served as its managing editor, actually. The voice of the press would be the beacon of their undoing. It says, oddly enough, that Crawford did find religion late in his criminal career. He did begin making large donations to the church, which he, when he was awaiting his sentencing for another crime that he had committed. He had truly stepped away and let his former allies enjoy their rackets. Instead, actually, Good Time Charlie made a play to topple his old crime partners. And it was the 20th of May, 1931, just before dinner at 4.30 p.m. Whoever pulled the trigger timed their visit just right. Shots rang out a short while after Crawford's bodyguard and his brother George stepped away to grab a bite. The killer ran from the room and dashed out a side door, reached the end of the covered porch, and jumped down the steps. Behind him, reeling, came Spencer. Down the side of his white shirt ran a stream of blood. He ran barehanded, stumbled off the side porch, and lurched towards the high gray walls of the Church of the Blessed Sacrament, which was only 50 feet away. Where did that guy go, he muttered, and he fell to the pavement and died. Hearing the shots, George raced back to the office at 665 Sunset Boulevard. It was already too late. He found his brother, half dead, leaning over a chair. Taking a round to the chest, journalist Herbert Spencer died rather quickly. Good time didn't go so easy. A blood transfusion at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital only prolonged what was coming. Plowing through his gut, the bullet ruptured a liver and kidney. There really wasn't much hope for him. Likely, in a confused state, when nurses at the police hospital asked if he knew who he was, he gasped, Wilson Henry. Though conscious, Crawford refused to name the culprit that gunned him down. When questioned, police decided he was trying to cover up the identity of the shooter. Stubborn, stubbornly, he mouthed something to the tune of, If I die, the secret goes with me to the grave. They pronounced him dead at 8.54 p.m. The authorities' prime suspect had plenty of motive, and Crawford and his former crime partner, ex-squad cop Guy McAfee, yep, like that McAfee, had recently stopped being friendly. Papers coined McAfee a Crawford lieutenant. Although they'd parted ways, Crawford couldn't see fit to leave it at that. It was good time feeding the words to Spencer at the paper. And once printed the articles, the sp- and once printed, the articles spurred the double murder. Not long after the smears hit the newsstands, Spencer received a threat, and it wasn't idle. Conveniently, McAfee had an alibi for the time of the murder, though, and solidifying his innocence, three days later, an unlikely confession surfaced. Throwing another odd twist at the plot, the murderer who stepped into the office of D.A. Burren Fitz to admit guilt, was a candidate for the municipal bench, former L.A. Deputy D.A. David Clark. Dave Clark, known by newsmen as Handsome and Debonair Dave, claimed self-defense, stating pistols were drawn at the height of a political quarrel. Now, you recall earlier how his wife Spencer's wife said he definitely didn't have a gun on him because she would have felt it. District Attorney Byrne Fitz elected not to play a formal role in the proceedings that followed, and he opted out for a very good reason. For seven years, Dave Clark worked under him. If the defense could prove that Fitz was unable to be objective, the prior relationship would have hampered the prosecution. For that reason, the DA wasn't willing to gamble. Filling in for Fitz to vie as handsome Dave's opposition was Special Prosecutor Joseph Ford. 
The graying veteran attorney hit hard at the courthouse, putting on a stellar performance. Dirtying Clark's reputation with all he had, he alleged the accused was closely allied with the underworld and its machinations, and feared the, quote, Crawford Spencer Fitz cleanup plan would blast, quote, his political hopes, robbing him of, quote, opportunity to rule as an underworld judge. What? Throwing a halo over good time Charlie, Ford went on about the racketeer's recent turn of the leaf, selling the story that he'd joined the church and decided to work for the good of the community. Even now, the events that transpired in Charlie Crawford's office that early evening of 1931, remain very murky. Although more modern claims take that the political boss was holding a cigar rather than a pistol. Little circulated details about the shooting suggest another story. Crawford wore an empty holster when he arrived at the hospital, for example. On the scene before police, Charlie's bodyguard, his brother had plenty of time to take the iron into his possession, but the reformed racketeer's weapons would later make a courtroom appearance. Whether or not Crawford actually drew upon the assailant wasn't the aspect of the crime that remained in question. Though he confessed to the killing, some simply did not believe David Clark pulled the trigger. The list of doubtful included Jack Spencer, the 25-year-old son of the deceased. Quote, it was someone from the underworld, the younger Spencer expressed to reporters, adding, quote, Dad knew too much about crime conditions. Three months before the killing, Spencer admitted to his son, quote, he had information to expose corruption and crime in Los Angeles and had received threatening letters. Crawford, who funded the Spencer-led paper, may have been the mouthpiece providing the intel. But if the gunman wasn't Clark... And Clark, without question, was present when lead ripped through the organs of two men claiming their lives. Then who did the killing? And why would a candidate for judge take the rap? Now, as you can imagine, in 1931, we did not have the forensics that we have today. So on the stand, a ballistic expert, Spencer Moxley, testified, quote, it was not possible to tell whether the bullets that killed Crawford and Spencer were fired from the same gun. This allowed for a draw-dropping question, was there more than one shooter? Despite the possibility, Clark stuck to his story. They had an argument. They both drew. He shot in self-defense. Quote, Fighting Bob Schuler, the religious L.A. superpower with the controversial newspaper press of his own, commented on the new angle. Via his popular radio show, Schuler announced that he did not believe the two men had been shot by one person. In line with what Jack Spencer told newsmen, Schuler also indicated the elder Spencer had recently confided he was holding on to some documents of interest. Spencer, he exclaimed, possessed evidence which could expose political graft and the underworld racket. Schuler offered a little more, though saying they never had an opportunity to discuss the finer details. Using a photo of Clark he'd taken from a judicial campaign ad running in the paper, D.A. Burton Fitz approached three eyewitnesses. Each indicated the man in the photograph looked an awful, like, an awful lot like the assailant they saw fleeing. One would say for certain on the stand, though, positively identifying Clark as the assailant of George Crawford. Given his relationship to the deceased, his word held little weight. They impeached his testimony. More interestingly, however, was a new version of the story that stated multiple individuals fled the scene. Quote, William E. French described as a new material witness told detectives he heard the sound of shots coming from Crawford's office and saw three men run from the building. Giving credit to the account, quote, his story tended to substantialize that of Jean Riley, film actress, although it's not uncommon for citizens to flee at the blare of a gun. It is a bit suspicious considering the detectives who questioned Crawford just before his passing swear he admitted two men had walked in and started shooting an accurate depiction of what transpired in that small room so many years ago may never really be known. 
It would seem we have a handful of pieces belonging to separate puzzles. Dave Clark survived two trials over the murder of Herbert Spencer, as we know from the beginning, and jurors couldn't agree during either one. So shockingly, in between courtroom bouts, the judge agreed to release the accused on $30,000 bail. Clark may just be the first man charged with murder to ever receive bail in Los Angeles. Though eventually acquitted, Clark's battle was only halfway over. Another killing still hung over his handsome head. The charge for killing Charles Crawford had been in a stall, pending over the outcome of the Spencer trial, but no one would ever stand trial before a judge for killing Good Time Charlie. Strangely, his widow asked Burton Fitz to abandon the effort. Rather coldly, she admitted having, quote, no confidence in Fitz or special prosecutor John Ford's ability to obtain a conviction. The DA's office dropped the charges over the Charles Crawford murder. So this is one of the most infamous unsolved murders in Los Angeles. And I just happened to stumble upon this location. Some believe that George McAfee orchestrated the entire fiasco, using poor Dave Clark as a pawn to set up Crawford for the hit. It is certainly of interest to know that after it all ended, the former deputy district attorney left his practice to come work for McAfee. Fast forward to today, and Crossroads of the World is home to some of the most influential minds in the entertainment industry. A pioneer in publishing for nearly 40 years, and some of the most pu- most successful publishers in the world have come through these doors. Frequently seen are actors and models visiting casting offices located within the complex. Casting director Sheila Jaffe is responsible for placing talent in features like Rocky Balboa and Ted. Shulman Photo Lab specializes in archival exhibition printing for galleries, museums, arch- archives, estates, and artists. In this oasis in the middle of Hollywood, It's not hard to imagine F. Scott Fitzgerald or Alfred Hitchcock walking on the grounds of the endless stream of talent that has walked on and off the lot for the last 80 years. Yeah, I didn't even get into how this was Alfred Hitchcock's office. So, the crossroads of the world represents the essence of Hollywood. All are welcome to follow their dreams, and while the world around it may change, history always remains pretty active. If there's one thing that I was sure of when I pulled up to this location and we walked onto the property, was that there had definitely been a murder, probably multiple murders, that everyone had been through there at that time, had probably encountered the ghost of Mr. Spencer and Mr. Crawford in some way. Because at the end of the day, it sounds like they were very active in their physical life. And as anyone may know, The spirits can be just as active in the afterlife. I'm not a professionally trained medium, but I've had this gift since I was very young, and I know exactly how to use it and exactly how it works for me. So I knew that something was up. So I decided to create this entire podcast series to share that with you all, because it gets lonely being the only person who can hear and see ghosts but I have such a great time speaking and talking to people and letting them know that some shit went down where they are. You can't go far in Los Angeles without finding some kind of mystery, murder, or something else that just sends chills up your spine. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we'll dive in even deeper into the secrets of Los Angeles and its historic mysteries. Remember, Stay curious, stay safe, and always trust your intuition.